Hello, welcome to my channel. This is part two of the Reasonable Faith Israel tour with Dr. William Lane Craig. In this lecture, Dr. Craig gives historical insight into the Herodian dynasty and how they featured in the New Testament writings of the apostles and in the biblical places of Caesarea in Haifa and Tiberias in Galilee. Herod was probably the greatest builder of the ancient world. Not only did he build Caesarea Maritima with its fantastic harbor, uh, its lighthouse, uh, its beautiful palace and, and, and swimming pool, hippodrome, but he also built the second temple in Jerusalem, the mount of which we'll see when we visit Jerusalem. The first temple, the Solomonic temple, was destroyed uh, in the Babylonian conquest, and it was Herod then, Herod the Great, who built the second temple in Jerusalem. He also built palaces, not only in Jerusalem and in Caesarea, but also in places like Masada, above that high plateau, the Herodium, which is a, a fantastic human construction that we'll also see Herod truly was a great builder and leader in the ancient world. However wicked and despicable a person he might have been in his character. <laughs> now, a few weeks ago, Jan and I were watching a performance of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar on PBS, and it struck me forcefully how intertwined Roman history is with New Testament history that we read about in the Gospels. For example, most of us probably are familiar with Mark Antony in Shakespeare's uh, Julius Caesar. Remember, it was Mark Antony who gives that wonderful funeral oration. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. And then he turns the crowd's emotions against the conspirators who were responsible for Caesar's assassination so that they seek revenge <coughs> against them. Now, Mark Antony was aligned or allied with Octavian, um, who was his uh, ally against the conspirators who murdered Caesar. Now, Octavian later himself became Caesar or the Roman emperor. It was this same Mark Antony that is famous for his collaboration with the fabulous queen of Egypt, Cleopatra. So Mark Antony and Cleopatra were uh, allies and friends. And uh, you wonder, well, what connection does this have with the New Testament? Well, in 42 BC, Mark Antony appointed Herod to be the Tetrarch of Galilee. So it was the same Mark Antony who was responsible for putting Herod the Great into power. A tetrarch is someone who rules one-fourth of a region. And uh, Mark Antony gave to Herod the tetrarchy of Galilee. Two years later, the Roman Senate declared Herod to be the king of the Jews. That is to say, all of uh, the Judean area. Uh, and so he became the Jewish king at that time. When Octavian became Caesar, he took on the name Augustus, and so became Augustus Caesar. And this, you remember, is the emperor whom Luke says issued a decree that all the world should be taxed, that sent Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem, where Jesus was born. So these people connect intimately with the gospel story. It was under Herod the Great's reign that Jesus was born, probably around 5 or 6 BC. Now you may wonder how he managed to be born before Christ, uh, but that's obviously due to a, a calculation error in our calendars. It was this Herod, Herod the Great, who built Caesarea Maritima that we saw today, that Matthew says was responsible for the slaughter of the infant uh, boys in the area of Bethlehem. And we know from extra-biblical sources that Herod was uh, guilty of many brutal 
acts. He was responsible, for example, for killing his own wife, and he killed two of his sons as well. So what Matthew reports about Bethlehem certainly wouldn't have been out of character for a man like Herod the Great. <coughs> Bethlehem was at that time a small village, and so probably the number of boys that were killed wouldn't have been in excess of around 20. Now, Herod <laughs> died in 4 BC. So shortly after Jesus was born, Herod passed away in 4 BC. And Josephus, the Jewish historian who was uh, initially against the Romans but then went over to the Roman side and wrote a, a history of the Jews, uh, comments on Herod's the de uh, great death in this way. This is a reading from his Antiquities. Now Herod's distemper greatly increased upon him after a severe manner. And this by God's judgment upon him for his sins. For a fire glowed in him slowly, which did not so much appear to the touch outwardly as it augmented his pains inwardly. For it brought upon him a vehement appetite to eat it, which he could not avoid to supply with one sort of food or other. His entrails were also exulcerated, uh, uh, and the chief violence of his pain lay on his colon. An aqueous and transparent liquor had also settled itself about his feet, and in a like manner it afflicted him at the bottom of his belly. Nay, further, his private member was putrefied and produced worms, and when he sat upright, he had difficulty breathing, which was very loathsome on account of the stench of his breath and the quickness of its returns. He had also convulsions in all parts of his body, which increased his strength to an insufferable degree. It was said by those who were endued with wisdom to foretell such things that God inflicted this punishment on the king on account of his great impiety. So when Herod died, uh, Josephus reports that he wanted to have genuine mourning at the time of his funeral, not just fake lamentation, uh, uh, an artifice uh, that would be expected at a funeral. Problem is, Herod was so hated that he knew no one would really lament or mourn to see him pass away. But Josephus said Herod had a plan to take care of that. What was the plan? Well, this is what Josephus reports. He commanded that all the principal men of the entire Jewish nation, wherever they lived, should be called to him. Accordingly, a great number came, because the whole nation was called. And all men heard of this call, and death was the penalty of such as should despise the epistles that were sent to call them. And now the king was in a wild rage against them all. And when they were come, he ordered them all to be shut up in the hippodrome and sent for his sister Salome and her husband Alexis. And he spoke thus to them, I shall die in a little time, so great are my pains. But what principally troubles me is this, that I shall die without being lamented and without such mourning as men usually expect at a king's death. But, he said, he had a plan such that if they do not refuse him their consent in what he desires, he said he shall have a great mourning at his funeral, and such as never had any king before him. For then the whole nation would mourn from their very soul, which would otherwise be done in sport and mockery only. He desired, therefore, that as soon as they had seen that he had given up the ghost, they shall place soldiers round the hippodrome while they do not yet know that he is dead, and shall give orders to have those that are in custody shot with their arrows. And this slaughter of them all will cause that he shall have the honor of, of a memorial mourning at his funeral. So this was Herod's plan to have genuine lamentation and mourning at his funeral. Maybe he was going to kill all the principal men in Judaism and the genuine lament and mourning for them would take place at the time of his funeral so that there would be real lamentation when he died. I mean, this is how perverse this madman was. Fortunately, 
uh, Salome and Alexis had the good sense not to carry out those executions. Well, after Herod the Great died, his youngest son, uh, Herod Antipas, was given the Tetrarchy of Galilee. So that was around 4 BC that Antipas, Herod Antipas, his youngest son, uh, became the Tetrarch in Galilee. And this is the Herod, Herod Antipas, who was in power during the time of Jesus' ministry. It was this Herod, Herod Antipas, who was responsible for the execution of John the Baptist. And again, this is an event that is not simply recorded in the New Testament. Josephus talks about John the Baptist. Did you know that? He refers to John the Baptist and tells of how Herod Antipas had him executed. Here's what Josephus says. Now some of the Jews thought that the destruction of Herod's army came from God, and that very justly, as a punishment of what he did against John, who was called the Baptist. For he was a good man, and commanded the Jews to exercise virtue, both as to righteousness towards one another, and piety towards God, and so to come to baptism. Now when many others came in crowds about him, for they were very greatly moved by hearing his words, Herod, who feared lest the general influence John had over the people might put it into his power and inclination to raise a rebellion, for they seemed ready to do anything he should advise, thought it best by putting him to death to prevent any mischief he might cause and not bring himself into difficulties by sparing a man who might make him repent of it when it would be too late. Accordingly, he was sent as a prisoner out of Herod's suspicious temper to Nacaris, which was a castle on the frontier on the border of uh, Israel, and was there put to death. So according to Josephus, Herod Antipas had John put away, lest he re lead some sort of rebellion uh, against the uh, Jewish and Roman leaders at that time. It was also this Antipas who was in Jerusalem at the time of the Passover when Jesus was handed over to the Romans. And Pilate, knowing that the Tetrarch of Galilee was in Jerusalem for the Passover and realizing Jesus was Galilean, says, send him to Herod. And so it was this Herod, Herod Antipas, who heard Jesus uh, in his uh, arrest and then sent him back to Pilate who finally condemned him to the cross. Now you might ask, well, why was he sent to Pilate? Well, you see, there wasn't any Jewish leader over Judea during Jesus' ministry. Herod, or Antipas, was the Tetrarch over Galilee, but um, Caesar Augustus, Octavian, uh, had decided to put Roman officials in charge of Judea. So he appointed a Roman prefect to be over Judea rather than a Jewish leader. Now, Augustus died in AD 14, 14 years uh, after Christ, uh, AD 14, and his stepson, Tiberius, then became Caesar, and he reigned until AD 37. So from AD 14 to AD 37, that's throughout the ministry of Jesus, it was Tiberius who was the Caesar. And of course, we are right now in the city of Tiberius, which Herod Antipas built and named Tiberius uh, in honor of this emperor. Now Pontius Pilate, uh, whom we mentioned, was the fifth prefect of the Roman province, province of Judea. He was fifth in the line of prefects that had been appointed. And he was the prefect uh, of Judea from AD 26 to 36. So for 10 years, during the uh, time that Jesus was ministering, uh, Pilate was the prefect of the Judean area. And as we saw in Caesarea today, uh, although Pilate is referred to in extra-biblical literary sources, until 1961 there was no physical evidence for the existence of Pontius Pilate. And then in 1961, in that theater at Caesarea Maritima, in which we sat today, they found this limestone block 
with an inscription on it from, of, of Pontius Pilatus, who is the Praefectus Judaei, that is to say, the Prefect of Judea. And so it was clear physical evidence of Pilate's being the Prefect during that time, and Caesarea was his capital city. Philo, the uh, Alexandrian Jewish philosopher and exegete, who was uh, also a first century writer, describes Pilate's character in the following words. Philo says that Pilate had uh, vindictiveness and a furious temper. He says he was naturally inflexible, a blend of self-will and relentlessness. Philo writes of his conduct as the governor of Judea as filled with, and I quote, briberies, insults, robberies, outrages and wanted injuries, executions without trial, constantly repeated, the ceaseless and supremely grievous <coughs> cruelty. So Pilate was a, a ruthless uh, ruler over Judea. Well, in the year uh, AD 39, Herod uh, Antipas was displaced uh, by the his stepson, or nephew rather, by his nephew and the grandson of Herod the Great, and this was Herod Agrippa the First. There are actually two Herod Agrippas mentioned in the New Testament, uh, and Herod Agrippa the First uh, was the one who deposed Herod Antipas and sent Antipas packing uh, into exile. And he is the first of the Herod Agrippas that's mentioned in the book of Acts. He ruled over Judea and Samaria for just three years, between AD 41 and AD 44. AD 41 to 44, the period that is described in the book of Acts. It was this Herod, Herod Agrippa I, that was responsible for the martyrdom of James, the son of Zebedee. Remember the two sons of Zebedee, James and John the fisherman, who fished this lake of Galilee out here. It was Herod Agrippa I that had James, the son of Zebedee, arrested and executed. He was also responsible for the arrest of Peter, uh, who then was miraculously delivered from prison. And he died, that is to say, Herod Agrippa I died in Caesarea Maritima in AD 44, the very city that we were in this morning. In fact, it was in the very theater in which we sat that Herod Agrippa I was struck down. And this is described in the 12th chapter of the book of Acts. This is what Luke writes in the book of Acts chapter 12. Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there a while. And on the appointed day, Herod wearing his royal robes sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. And they shouted, this is the voice of a god, not a man. And immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. Now notice, Luke doesn't say he died and was eaten by worms. He's not talking here about maggots that consumed the court. He was eaten by worms and died. In other words, he was afflicted with some kind of parasite from which he died. And Josephus expands on this same event. This is what Josephus writes uh, about what happened to Herod Agrippa I. On the second day of the shows, he put on a garment made wholly of silver and of a contexture truly wonderful and came into the theater early in the morning, at which time the silver of his garment being illuminated by the fresh reflection of the sun's rays upon it, shone out after a surprising manner and was so resplendent as to spread a horror over those who looked intently upon him. And presently, his flatterers cried out, one from one place and one from another, that he was a god. And upon this the king did neither rebuke them nor reject their impious flattery. But as he presently afterward looked up, he saw an owl sitting on a rope over his head. And immediately he understood that this bird was the messenger of ill tidings and fell into the deepest sorrows. A severe pain also arose in his belly and began in the most violent manner. Accordingly, he was carried into the palace, and the rumor went abroad everywhere that he would certainly die in a little time. 
And when he had been quite worn out by the pain in his belly for five days, he departed this life being in the 54th year of his age. So exactly as the book of Acts describes, Josephus gives us a narrative of how he was struck down in the theater at Caesarea Maritima, where we sat, uh, and was carried off and then shortly died thereafter. Several years after Herod Agrippa uh, died, then his son, who was Herod Agrippa II, uh, came to power. And Herod Agrippa II um, was the ruler, the Jewish ruler, who was in power when Paul was arrested in Jerusalem and then imprisoned in Caesarea for two years. That was between A.D. 57 and A.D. 59. Paul was arrested in Jerusalem. He was taken down to the coast and put in prison in Caesarea and remained there for two years. And Agrippa II came down to Caesarea with his sister, not his wife, it was his sister, Bernice, with whom he lived in an incestuous relation. They came down to Caesarea, and the Roman governor Festus gave Paul an audience with this king, with Agrippa II. And it was with Agrippa II that Paul had this famous exchange. Uh, you can just imagine Paul speaking to Festus, the Roman governor, who thinks he's mad, and then King Agrippa and his sister. And, and Paul says to Festus, the king, that is Agrippa, he's referring to the king, not Festus. He says, the king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I'm convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. And then he turns to King Agrippa, and he says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do, addressing him directly. And Agrippa says to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to become a Christian? I mean, this is just wild, this exchange between <laughs> Paul and Agrippa II. And Paul replied, short time or long, I pray God that not only you, but all who are listening to my voice may become what I am, except for these chains. What a, what a meeting between Paul and Agrippa II. Well, that's not the end of the story of Caesarea, uh, not at all. In AD 66, AD 66, this is after the book of Acts closes, a massacre of the Jews occurred in Caesarea, Maritima and the local synagogue was desecrated. And this sparked the disastrous Jewish revolt that resulted in the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, and finally in the tragedy of Masada, which we'll see later on in the week. So the Jewish revolt actually began in Caesarea, where we were today. Herod Agrippa II was the king at the time of the revolt but he sided with the Romans, and therefore he managed to survive the Roman crushing of the Jewish revolt. Well, a second Jewish revolt occurred in the year 132. Uh, this is often called the Bar Kokhba revolt because Simon Bar Kokhba led this revolt against the Romans. And this one ended in the same way with the destruction of Jerusalem and the expulsion of the Jews. And thereafter, Caesarea became an important center of early Christianity in Palestine. Christianity has a long and noble history in Caesarea. You remember according to the book of Acts, Christianity was first introduced into Caesarea by Peter's <coughs> preaching to the household of a Roman centurion named Cornelius. And this was sometime uh, shortly after Paul's conversion in the mid-30s. Uh, but it even preceded Paul's outreach to the Gentiles. By the time of the third century, uh, Christianity had become firmly entrenched in Caesarea. The great Christian uh, philosopher and apologist, Oregon, wrote and taught and lived in Caesarea Maritima. His dates are 185, to 254. 
And Oregon is one of the earliest and greatest Christian philosophers and apologists. He's the man who wrote against Celsus, who was the early heathen uh, or pagan critic of Christianity. Moreover, the famous church historian Eusebius also lived in Caesarea. Eusebius was the bishop of Caesarea between 315 and 318. And the theological school that was centered in Caesarea uh, had a fantastic reputation. It, it had the most extensive theological library of the time, over 30,000 manuscripts. Uh, were held at Caesarea. And such notable church fathers as Gregory Nazianzus, Basil the Great, and Jerome came and studied in Caesarea. Also, the Caesarean family of texts comes from this city and is one of the most important witnesses to the original text of the New Testament. There are various families of manuscripts, and the Caesarean text is one of the most reliable and earliest of the Greek text that is used for reconstructing the New Testament. So this is a city of incredible importance to early Christian church history. Let me just say something more about Oregon's connection with Caesarea because I find this very inspirational personally as a Christian philosopher. Oregon was a uh, prominent lay teacher. He was a layman in Alexandria in Egypt. But about the year 230, he traveled to Caesarea, here in Palestine, and uh, while visiting here, he was welcomed by the local Christian believers, and the local bishop here in Caesarea ordained Oregon as a priest. Well, his own bishop back in Alexandria, Demetrius, was very unhappy about Oregon's being ordained by a bishop in another town to the priesthood, and so he banished Oregon from Alexandria. And so in the year 231, Oregon left Alexandria and made his permanent home from then on in Caesarea. Now in the year 249, the Roman Emperor Decius began the first systematic persecutions of Christians in the Roman Empire. Sure, there had always been local outbreaks of persecution, but under Decius, this was the first systematic attempt by the Roman Empire to eradicate Christianity entirely from the Roman Empire. And Eusebius tells of how Oregon, who by that time was 66 years old, he was an old man, he was 66 years old, he was arrested by the Roman authorities, he was tortured, he was pilloried, he was fastened hand and foot in the blocks for days and yet, without yielding, he never denied Christ. He held to his faith unswervingly, despite being tortured. And when I think of that, I think, how many Christian philosophers today could think of a <laughs> like that? It would be just amazing. Oregon survived his tortures, but he died just three years later due to the injuries that he had sustained in being tortured for Christ. In the year 303, the Roman Emperor Diocletian began the great persecution of the Christians in the Roman Empire. This was the most dreadful persecution that had ever been launched to exterminate Christian belief from the Roman Empire. And Eusebius wrote an account of the Diocletian persecution entitled The Martyrs of Palestine which I recently read in my devotional reading uh, in the morning. And he describes the horrible atrocities that were committed throughout the Roman Empire, but especially in Caesarea against the Christians. And I want to read you a little bit of Eusebius' account of what happened in Caesarea. He says, in the fourth year of the persecution against us, the following event, truly worthy of record, occurred in the city of Caesarea. As it was an ancient custom to furnish the spectators more splendid shows when the emperors were present than at other times, it was necessary at this time, as the emperor was giving the exhibition, to add to the shows something more wonderful. And what should this be? 
He says, a witness of our doctrine, that is a Christian, was brought into the midst and endured the contest for the true and only religion. This was Agapius, who was with Thecla, the second to be thrown to the wild beasts for food. He had also three times and more marched with malefactors from the prison to the arena. And every time after threats from the judge had been reserved for other conflicts. But the emperor being present, he was brought out at this time as if he had been appropriately reserved for this occasion until the very word of the Savior should be fulfilled in him which through divine knowledge he declared to his disciples that they should be brought before kings on account of their testimony unto him. He was taken into the midst of the arena with a certain malefactor who they said was charged with the murder of his master. But this murder of, of his master, when he had been cast to the wild beasts, was deemed worthy of compassion and humanity, almost like Barabbas in the time of our Savior. And the whole theater resounded with cries and shouts of approval because the murderer was humanely saved by the emperor and deemed worthy of honor and freedom. But the athlete of religion, they often referred to these people who endured torture as athletes, uh, contestants. The athlete of religion was first summoned by the tyrant and promised liberty if he would deny his profession. But he testified with a loud voice that not for any fault, but for the religion of the creator of the universe, he would readily and with pleasure endure whatever might be inflicted upon him. Having said this, he joined the deed to the word and rushed to meet a bear which had been let loose against him, surrendering himself most cheerfully to be devoured by him. After this, as he still breathed, he was cast into prison, and living yet one more day, stones were bound to his feet, and he was drowned in the depths of the sea. Such was the martyrdom of Agapius. <clears throat> Eusebius goes on, again in Caesarea, when the persecution had continued to the fifth year, on the very Lord's day of our resurrection, on Easter, Theodosia, a virgin from Tyre, a faithful and sedate maiden, not yet 18 years of age, not yet 18 years of age, went up to certain prisoners who were confessing the kingdom of Christ and sitting before the judgment seat and saluted them, as is probable, and besought them to remember her when they came before the Lord. Thereupon, as if she had committed a profane and impious act, the soldiers seized her and led her to the governor. And he immediately, like a madman and a wild beast in his anger, tortured her with dreadful and most terrible torments in her sides and breasts, even to the very bones. And as she still breathed, and withal stood with a joyful and beaming countenance, he ordered her thrown into the waves of the sea. Then passing from her to the other confessors, he condemned all of them to the copper mines in Fino in Palestine. And these horrible persecutions endured for a decade, for 10 years, until 312, when the new emperors, uh, Constantine and Licinius, uh, issued their edict of toleration. When Constantine and his colleague Licinius came to the emperorship, they promulgated an edict of toleration. And it is marvelous to read this edict that Constantine and his colleague promulgated. It sounds so modern in its espousal of religious toleration for not just Christianity, but all faiths in the Roman Empire. And let me read you from this edict of toleration that they promulgated in 312. Quote, we thought it fit to commend these things most fully to your care that you may know that we have given to those Christians free and unrestricted opportunity of religious worship. When you see that this has been granted to them by us, you will know that we have also conceded to other religions the right of open and free observance of their worship for the sake of the peace of our times, that each one may have the free opportunity 
to worship as he pleases. This regulation is made so that we may not seem to detract from any dignity or any religion. And so at last religious toleration came to the Roman world and uh, peace was restored to the Christian faith. The martyrdom was ended. But when we walked around Caesarea, I hope now as you look back on it, you realize uh, we were walking on sacred ground. This was ground that had been hallowed by the blood of the martyrs that were killed there and drowned in the sea that, that we looked into. Uh, to use Tertullian's very famous phrase, uh, the blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church. Neither the Jewish rulers that opposed Christianity nor the Roman empires or, or emperors or local officials could extinguish uh, this faith. And so I hope that from now on, when you read the New Testament and you think of Herod the Great, of Pontius Pilate, of Paul, when you think of Caesarea and what happened there, you'll remember the faithful martyrs and their testimony to Christ that, that they endured even unto death and that this will give you a, a, a new appreciation for what you read and what we've experienced today. Well, those were the reflections that I wanted to share with you. Uh, we'll now have a little break, and those who want to stick around and uh, talk uh, are, are happy to, or welcome to do so. so. A brief introduction of Dr. William Lane Craig. From his website, reasonablefaith.org, it says that he's a visiting scholar of philosophy at Talbot School of Theology, and Professor of Philosophy at Houston Baptist University. At the age of 16, as a junior in high school, he first heard the message of the Christian Gospel and yielded his life to Christ. He went on to complete a doctorate in philosophy and another in theology. He has authored or edited over 30 books as well as over a hundred articles in professional journals of philosophy and theology. In 2016, Dr. Craig was named by the best schools as one of the 50 most influential living philosophers. 